We're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. You just got to be honest. That was the worst Super Bowl I've ever watched. It was so boring. The Patriots win again. I hope you're happy, Bruce. All right. Good evening, everyone in Plano, Texas. Hello, everyone watching, listening online. I'm sure you are just wonderful, lovely people. We'd love to meet you one day. Uh, and hello to all the beautiful people in the room, the beautiful people, the beautiful people. That is a Marilyn Manson joke. All right. Hello to all you beautiful people. Welcome to Redemption Church. My name is Chris Fluitt. I'm so blessed to serve as lead pastor here at Redemption and I'm happy to share the Word of God with you today. Is anyone ready to receive the Word of God today? Are you ready to receive the Word of God? Absolutely. Good. Because I'm going to need you all to preach with me today, all right? We are kicking off a brand new series today, and I believe it's going to help each and every one of you. I want you to make plans to be here each week for it. It is called Greater Than. Greater Than, all right? And now this is not going to be like math problems, but it is going to have some some thoughts in it based on math right uh no one searches for lesser things do you agree no one searches for lesser things we search for greater things right no one is sitting in this place going you know what i wish i had a slower smartphone i just really wish i had a worse smartphone right i've had smartphone problems recently and you know what i i went out to get a better smartphone right if you're going out for a better car you go out for a better car right you you look for a better housing situation no anybody looking for a worse job you know i've got a good job but i'm really out there looking for a worse one no no one does that no one searches for lesser things we all search for greater things can i get an amen, amen. all right we're on the same track good a world has a hierarchy what's a hierarchy it's a system of organizing and assigning value our world has a hierarchy, this system where we rank each other. We assign value and rank for everything and everyone. And this is true because you look at a person's car and you rank that car. And you think, my car is better than theirs. It's silly, but people do this all the time. Maybe that's not what you think about, but we compare people's phones and rank them well I've got a uh, those poor people with their Android phones I've actually heard people say that like, but we rank things we think ours is better or theirs is better we assign rank to jobs we assign rank to houses if we are not careful people even sign rank to spouses and this greater game is dangerously played out in our culture I know I'm not, you don't play that greater game, right? But can we just be honest and say our world plays this greater game? We assign rank to everything. And there are three things that are essential to the ranking. It's three categories of this hierarchy. And they are, probably you've heard of sex, money, and power. Say those three things with me. Sex, money, and power everyone in this ranking system is judged by these categories these categories almost act like currency within our world people can use their sex money and power to accumulate more gain people can use their sex money and power to manipulate others people can use their sex money and power to win the attention of others does anybody know what i'm talking about all right, are you with me? Are you dis in disagreement? Or are you just nervous? Because I said, oh, three-letter word that starts with S. C, I I when you think about advertisements, right? You really want to see where a culture is? Look at its advertisements, right? They're trying to convince you to buy something, right? That's, what do they use to convince you to buy? Do any ads use sex to convince you to buy? What about this? Do any ads use the promise of money? as an attractant right oh my goodness successful people drive this car do you want to be a successful person we'll go in 30 40 50 thousand dollars in debt and then you'll be a successful person what a racket that is 
You can be successful too. You just go $50,000 in the hole. They said I was successful. It's so good. And people will sign up for that, right? What about power? Do any ads promise you power? Big, shirtless, muscular man walks out of the ocean. And you too can smell like this man by the beach cologne by Calvin Klein today. That was a Seinfeld reference and no one got it. Our society places sex, money, and power at the top of the hierarchy. We may not admit it with our words, but our actions and our focus reveal that our world believes nothing is greater than sex, money, and power. No one ever searches for the lesser things. We all search for the greater things. So today, we are going to talk about sex. Our young people were so excited when I told them this. They're, they're here. They, they were like, they were early. Omari was there early. He was there standing in the cold going, I'm ready, Pastor Chris. I am ready. <laughs> right? So we're going to talk about that today. Try to think of an actor or actress that is not sexy. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll let, let you think about it. You have to dip into the segment of actors who are supporting character actors to come up with someone who is not drop dead gorgeous. I'm really sorry to break it to you, but the Steve Buscemi featured romantic comedy, it has been delayed again. I don't think that movie is ever going to be made. Do we have a picture of Steve Buscemi, please? Do we? There it is. That guy, that, that romantic comedy has been on the shelf for years. I just don't know when that thing's going to get, that's never going to get made, right? That is never going to get made. He's a great actor, but he is never going to be that lead role. He is never going to get the girl at the end of the movie unless the girl looks exactly like him and it's like a comic bit, right? You understand this because sex sells. Sex is everywhere. It's in the news. It used to be that the news was very careful about covering things of the sexual nature. Do you remember that growing up? It's kind of different. I remember sometime in the 90s, things really switched with a certain president, and it was, whoa, the, the way they started covering that story was crazy. Can I tell you now, covering sex is ratings heaven. They cannot wait to talk about porn stars in the news. They cannot wait to talk about scandal. They cannot wait to do it. Just this week, major headlines ran about sexting pics revealing the private parts of a billionaire. And people just ate it up. People were buying those magazines. People were, that's total clickbait. I, it's on our screens. It's on our computer screens, movie screens, TV screens, phone screens. It's everywhere. It's in our music. It's in our arts. Some of you in this room, even right now, you might be suffering from the feeling that you do not measure up to the sexiness of others. You feel lesser than. You might think, well, they're, they're just greater than I am. You feel like you're less valuable because of a hierarchy, a ranking system of sex, money, and power. Today, I want to tell you that there is something greater than sex. There is something greater than the entire hierarchy of this world. There is something greater than the ranking system that looks at people and puts a number on them. There is something greater. And if you have this greater thing, then nothing else matters. I want you to go after greater things today. And here it is, love. Love is greater than sex. It is time to break this manipulative hierarchy by declaring it less than and pursuing something greater. And that greater thing is love. Now, right now in this moment is where most Christians go the wrong direction in the subject. We're talking about love is greater than sex. But instead of showing how love is greater, we spend all our time showing how sex is bad. 
I grew up in a church very much like that. The church can be a place that preaches that sex is bad and something to never enjoy. Maybe you relate to that. For a moment, let me tell you, sex is not bad. Sex is not equal to bad. God created sex. Sex is a God thing. And if it's a God thing, it's a good thing. Look at somebody say it's a good thing. If God created sex, he created you to enjoy it. It is supposed to be enjoyed. There are no baby boys and baby girls outside of sexual reproduction. It actually produces life. It is a blessing. It is meant to be an expression of love and, the, and a sign of a fulfilled love covenant. Sex is not bad. Sex is good. But sex is not greater than love. Can you say love is greater than sex? How so? Well, sex is limited. Sex is limited physically. Sex is a physical thing. Love has no physical limitation. Love is physical, spiritual, and emotional. That's what love is. Sex is limited to location, but love has no such limit. You can love someone no matter where they are located. Sex is conditional. Sex only happens when those conditions are met. The lighting is just right. The music is just right. They look just right. Everything is just right. It's, it's got to have all those conditions. And it's like anything can break that condition. But love, there is a love that is unconditional. There is a love that remains just as strong when you fall short of perfection. Love is greater. We're going to look at a verse that talks about love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's the love chapter beginning at verse 4 going through verse 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Now let's reread the scripture. And we're going to replace the word love with sex. And I want you to read it out loud. And I want you to just see if it feels like it's true. How about this? Sex is patient. Come on, read it out with me. Sex is patient. Sex is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Sex does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Sex never fails. Can, I, can you agree with me? That there's no way that's true. Heck no. That is not true at all. Let, let's look at it. Is sex patient? My goodness. Like, we have to sit our young people down and say, listen, you got to learn patience when it comes to sex because sex is not patient. But here, newsflash, if they will not wait for you, that is not love. Can I get an amen on that? Is that do we still believe that in 2019? If somebody will not wait for you, that is not patient love. Sex is not patient. Sex, does it not envy? No, sex envies completely. Does, is sex boastful and proud? Who remembers high school? There was something terrible that happened in high school where you would be in the locker room and boys would talk about conquests. And sometimes they weren't even true. Who knew if they were true? But they would talk about so-and-so that they had sex with that person. And you know what? They were kind of boastful about it. They were kind of proud about it. Love is not boastful. Love is not proud. You can't say this about sex. It's completely boastful. It's completely proud. 
Can we say this sex is completely self-seeking? Who can say that sex never fails? No, no, no. You can only say this about love. Because love is greater than sex. 1 Corinthians 13 and 13. A few verses later. And now these three remain. Read them with me. Faith, hope, love. But the greatest of these is love. Instead of sex, money, and power, your Bible directs you to a different hierarchy. It directs you to a different value system. And that value system is faith, hope, and love. Here's the context of that verse. The verse is that there are three things, faith, hope, and love. And they are the only three things that are going to remain when we go into the new kingdom. When God's kingdom comes to earth, there are only three things that are going to remain. Praise the Lord, the IRS is not one of those things. The IRS is going to go away. Guess what? Religion, all these religions, there's not going to be any religion anymore. You're going to have a direct relationship with God. That All the corrupt governments of the world will go away. All the evil and atrocities will go away. There are only three things that are going to make it from this earth into the world that is to come. Somebody named Name those three things. They are faith, hope, and love. Sex, money, power are not going to cross that threshold. That value system that degrades people, that value system that depresses people is not going to cross that threshold into the new kingdom. But faith, hope, and love will. And what is the greatest of these three? It is love. Sex can give you a one night stand, but you can love someone forever. You can love someone for all eternity. You can have a love for somebody that when Christ comes, that love carries right over into heaven for eternity. Do you want that kind of love? Does that sound like a greater thing? Yes, it is. An often overlooked book speaks a lot about love. It is the Songs of Solomon. We're going to look at that, chapter 8, verse 6 through 7. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death. It's jealousy as unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. This verse can be used to describe our relationship with God. We should place God, our God, the Lord Jesus Christ, as a seal over your heart. It is a seal over your heart. And because the love relationship with God is the perfect example of love, this verse can also be used as the perfect model for love relationships with others. Do you understand that? So because it's the perfect relationship, it's also what we ought to make our earthly relationships look like. Your marriage ought to look like this. Your relationship with your children ought to look like this. Your relationship with your friends ought to look like this. You need to set a seal on your heart. Is your heart sealed? Is your heart sealed? You see, if your heart's sealed, you can't, not just anything is going to get into your heart. Not just anyone is going to have access to your heart because your heart is sealed. And we need God to be set upon our heart as a seal. But guess what? Your marriage partner, your spouse needs to be set on your heart as a seal. If you really want to divorce proof your marriage, you need to have your spouse set upon your heart like a seal. And when someone else comes along, there is no way for them to get 
into access with your heart because your heart has been sealed to another person. Come on, that's something the world needs to hear. That you love your spouse so much that no one else can find room inside your heart to set up shop. You see, that's where divorce starts. Divorce starts by giving someone access to your heart that should not have been given access to your heart and sometimes it can be so innocent sometimes it can be an emotional thing just sharing a laugh with someone but that little room can make way inside your heart and that is stealing room from your spouse you need to set a seal upon your heart you need your God to be that seal and you need to set your spouse as that seal. Can I tell you, you need to pray for your spouse in such a way that they are on your heart. Pray that way. Can you pray that way? Your heart's sealed. Your heart is covenanted. That's a strong word. They talk about the seal of covenant in the Bible. Your heart is covenanted in love towards someone else else and the bible goes on to say in song of solomon that this love is strong can you say strong love it says it's as strong as death is death strong <coughs> i only know a few people that have ever come back from death once death grabs onto you it is that strong you need a love that is as strong as as death can i give you another way of looking at it it's a love that even lasts through death that death cannot even stop this love it is unyielding as the grave it says it burns like fire yet unquenchable can i tell you something that some people have the passionate fire but it's quenchable See, that, that's really what sex can be. Sex can be a burning, passionate thing, but then morning comes and somebody's gathering their clothes and they're hoping the other person can't wake up because they don't want to have an awkward encounter with them. That was quenchable, right? It was fiery for a moment, but it was quickly quenched. But there is a love that burns like fire, yet is unquenchable. I want to pray for you. You need to start praying in your heart that in your marriage you have a fiery love, but you also need an unquenchable love. And sometimes we focus on one and not the other. If you've been praying God, I want a fiery, passionate love with my wife. But you haven't been praying, God, give me an unquenchable love for my wife. That's something you need to do. You need to do it. You need to change the way you're praying. Unconditional love that cannot be changed by situation. And it says that it cannot be swept away. Love cannot be bought with money. That verse continues. Do we have that verse? If you could put that up, I would love it. Love cannot be bought with money. If you tried to buy love with a great amount of wealth, the wealth would be scorned, it says. What does that mean? It means it would be despised. It means that it would not be appreciated. It would be unappreciated. It would actually be an insult for you to try to buy this love. Why? Because love is greater Love is greater than all the wealth of a house. Everything you could, you could offer, love is greater than sex. It is stronger. It is more faithful. It is more valuable. It is more dependable. Love is greater in every single way. There are many more verses I could dive into, but I'm hopeful that you understand and agree that love is greater. Say amen if you do. Kevin doesn't, so I'm going to spend 20 more minutes on this part. Just kidding, Kevin. Let's move on to this important part. Sex can exist outside of love. Let's talk about it. Earlier I told you sex was good, but now I'm going to tell you that sex is no bueno. Sex is not good outside of love. We could expand this idea, actually, that nothing is good outside of love. Of love. Nothing is good 
outside of love. I'm going to say it one more time. I want you to say it with me. Nothing is good outside of love. In basketball, there is something, and you score by, by getting the ball through the, through the hoop. That's right. That's how basketball works. There is a hoop. Everybody see that hoop on, on our screen right there? Only shots that go through the hoop are good. It doesn't matter how pretty your release is. If it doesn't go through the hoop, it's no good. It doesn't matter how high you can jump. I, there, one of my favorite things to, uh, to look up at YouTube is sports fails, and there's some wonderful sports fails out there. There's one Laker that he just he pulls up, he shoots this three, and he's like so confident, goes in, he like turns around, he makes the three sign. He's like, and you see that ball go up and just clang. <laughs> He has no idea, and he sees everybody grab the ball and go run and score on him. Love, love stuff like that. It doesn't matter what you do. If it doesn't go through the hoop, it is no good. Now, the basketball can exist outside of the hoop, but it is only when it goes through the hoop is it valuable and is it beneficial to the team. Are you following me? Love is that basketball hoop. And only things that go through love are good. If you have to have a conversation with your spouse, make sure it goes through the hoop. You have that conversation, but you make sure you have that conversation in love. You following me? If you need to correct your children, sometimes you have to take a belt off and spank them. But you have to make sure that you correct them through the hoop of love. I want to tell you this about God. I wish I had a long time to spend on this, but I don't. God's every action towards you has been through the hoop of love. Even when he has corrected you, it has been through the hoop of love. The Bible says he corrects who he loves. And so even when he corrects you, even when God isn't showing up like you want him to, even when God isn't answering the prayer, it's not because he doesn't love you. Every action he's ever taken towards you has been in love. He goes through the hoop of love. If you toss up a shot, but it doesn't go through love, it is no good. In basketball, we call that a brick. It just clangs off the iron that's why the love chapter starts like this if i speak with the tongues of angels and men but have not but have not love it is worthless you've got to interact with those through the hoop of love if you have been interacting with your spouse outside of love you got to change that right now and young people especially I want to tell you that you can have sex outside of love, and that is not good. It is very harmful. Sex outside of love is harmful. One night stands, adultery, cheating on your spouse, unwanted pregnancy, sexual addiction, sexually transmitted disease, pornography, abuse, rape, molestation, perversions like pedophilia, prostitution, sex trafficking. These are all examples of sex outside of love do you agree absolutely sex outside of love is not good but here's where it's really confusing because our world celebrates sex absolutely it's part of the hierarchy right it's it's that system of of dedicating value to someone young people the world will tell you that there is something wrong with you if you're still a virgin Young people, the world will tell you that you need to become good at sex by having as many partners as possible. What great advice. Not at all. Young people, the world will tell you that if they really love you, they will have sex with you when and ever you want them to, however you want them to. And if they won't have sex with you, then they must not really love you. Am I telling the truth? Am I going too far or am I just telling it like it is? Y'all are not very reassuring. Am I telling you like it is? Thank you. Young people, the world will confuse you 
but I'm telling you the truth. Do not have sex outside of love. But what is love? What is love? Let's talk about that. What is love equal? You see, the world is confused on sex, but they are equally, if not more, confused on love. Do you agree? The world will tell you that love equals sex. Well, is that what the world will tell you? Absolutely. But that's not true. We've already told you that love is greater than sex. We have told you that sex can be experienced outside of love and that it is harmful, that love is greater in every way. The world will also tell you that love, this one's really weird, equals love. Maybe you've seen that. Love equals love. I remember in first grade, I was given a test where you have to use a word in a sentence. Anybody have those tests? You remember those tests? You got to use this word in a sentence. And let's say the word was excited, right? So here I am, I'm in first grade, and I totally know what excited is, but I'm lazy. I'm excitedly lazy, right? And so I, I'm like, gosh, here's my sentence. What does excited mean? And I thought I was so clever. I thought I have found a way to beat the system. I'm like an evil genius. I did not get credit for that sentence until I rewrote it because although I used the word in a sentence, I didn't reveal to the teacher that I actually understood what the word meant. And that was the point of the whole question. People who say love equals love are not showing that they understand the meaning of the word love. What's the definition of love? Love. What's the definition of, of onomatopoeia? Onomatopoeia. Like, that does not help anyone. <laughs> love equals love means that I can do whatever I want and call it love. And you can't argue with me because then you are not being loving. You're being hateful. You see how that works. But this is how our world system is working right now. This is how people are thinking about love. Some relationships are not love. We've just got to say it. Some relationships are not love. If it's abuse, that's not love. If someone is just using you, that's not love. If someone is only after your money or they're only after physical intimacy, if they are not after all that you are, that's not love. There are some relationships that are not love. And can I tell you, some actions are not love. Not everything is love. You can't call everything love. If you call everything love, it's going to get real weird and real stupid real quick. It's too creepy to talk about in church, so y'all will just have coffee later if you want to talk about that. Christians above everyone should be able to tell you what love equals. What does love equal? Say it loud. Love equals God. God equals love. Your Bible gives us this revelation. It's in 1 John chapter 4, 7 through 8. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from, where does love come from? It comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and God knows them do you realize how deep this is this is powerful whoever does not love does not know God because God is love tech team do we have that verse we got to get these verses up buddy God is love say it out strong God is love no wonder love is greater because God is love and God is love greater God is love and God is greater do you follow this logic with me if God doesn't want you to do something then that thing is not of God do you agree if he says thou shalt not steal right stealing is not of God therefore stealing is not a loving act do you follow my logic? Are you with me? Let's follow it down a little more. God says, do not murder. Murder is not of God. Therefore, murder is not a loving act. He says, do not fornicate. That means to have sex outside of marriage. He says, do not commit adultery, which is to be in a marriage 
but have sex with someone outside of the marriage. That is not of God, so it is not a loving act. God says he hates divorce, so divorce is not of God. Divorce is not a loving act. Do you understand this? Of course you understand this, because you understand things that are abusive, things that hurt people, things that that take from others selfishly. It's not of God. You know it's not of love. Well, let me tell you, there's some things in your Bible it tells you not to do, and it goes against your thinking, but you need to find a way to trust God in that, that God is telling you this is not of me, so therefore that is not a loving act. If you don't know God, you don't know what love is. If you don't know what God has said in his word, don't take for granted that you understand what love is. Do not look to the world to define love. Look to God. Jesus on the cross is the picture, the true defining picture of God's love. Do you agree? 1 John 4 and 10 says, This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. What is love? That's love. Jesus on the cross is the picture of, the true defining picture of God's love. John 15 and 13 says this, greater love has no man than this to lay down his life for one's friends. Jesus on the cross is the picture, the true defining picture of God's love. Luke 23 and 34, Jesus said this from the cross. He says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing even as they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Jesus on the cross is the picture of True, defining love, God's love. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. What am I telling you? Jesus on the cross is the true picture of love. God's defining picture of love. That's why Jesus on the cross means everything. You understand that Jesus on the cross equals heaven for you. You understand that we get, but do you also understand this? Jesus self-sacrificing himself is the picture that your marriage needs to have. Jesus on the cross saying forgive them is the picture your marriage needs to have. Jesus on the cross is the picture of your parenting. It's the, the picture of your relationship with your children. Jesus on the cross is the picture of you with your friend when they've done you wrong, when they've said something wrong. Jesus on the cross is the picture of everything. It's not just the picture of, okay, now I get to heaven. No, it is your beginning and it is your end. It is your alpha. It is your omega. It is everything. Everything, everything goes back to the picture of love. And there is no greater picture of love than the picture of Jesus Christ on the cross. Hollywood has never been able to give us a better picture. No romantic novel has ever been able to give us a better picture of love. The greatest picture of love, somebody say it, is Jesus on the cross. If you believe that, can you clap your hands for Jesus? Can you say thank you, Lord, for the cross? Thank you, God, for being on the cross for me. I want to give you one more point. Then we're going to spend some time talking to God together. We're going to worship God together. Here it is. Sex focuses on the longing. And love focuses on on the belonging. Can you say that with me? Sex focuses on the longing, but love focuses on the belonging. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 3. It's such a beautifully simple verse. It says, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. Can you say that first part of that sentence with me? I am my beloved's, and my beloved is is mine in love there is not just longing but there is a belonging in love you belong to one another and they belong to you can i tell you that you belong to god because he loves you but here's the other thing god belongs to you when you love him because there's this relationship you can go to god with anything Because you belong. 
and you can be in heaven one day because you belong there. Why do you belong there? Because you belong to him and he belongs to you. And in your marriage, can your spouse come and tell you anything? Can your children come and tell you anything? If they don't, if they aren't able to do that, then they don't really belong to you. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. We belong. We belong. We belong. God loves you. Do you love God? If you will come into a loving relationship with God today, you will belong to God, and God will belong to you. Can you even just fathom that sentence? That's just kind of a weird sentence. God belongs to you? That's what I'm saying. If you have felt like you don't belong, you see, that that's what the hierarchy does, right? I don't know if you know this, but high school was not easy for Chris Fluitt. <laughs> it's not easy, right? Like y'all are, none of y'all are surprised. It's, it's amazing. High school was not easy. I felt like I didn't belong. Anybody re- relate to that? Anybody walk into a room and feel like they don't belong? Some people even walk into a church and they just, oh, I don't know if I belong here. I just, I don't know. I don't know. I'm like... Sarah, Sarah, this one time I took Sarah to a, a, a church and she had never been to a church that lifts their hands when they worship kind of a thing. And so she thought there's they're crazy in there. There's I don't know if I belong here. She has a story about a snake that I'll, I'll tell some other time. She's she she thought I was going to take her to a church that handled snakes. I don't I don't know what to say. I don't even know what to do with that to today. But I told her I assured her neither of us belong in that kind of church. With, with snakes. Amen. And everyone said amen. 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 All right. Put the snakes back. Don't bring them out yet. It's a joke. <laughs> if you feel like you don't belong, you need the love of God. I remember the moment where the love of God came into my life. And it's like I didn't worry about belonging to the cool group or to all the other groups. You know how high school had all those groups I belong to God and I started loving God and God started dealing with my heart to love other people it's wonderful if you felt like a loser who lacks worth and value you know what you need you need to belong you need the love of God if you have felt like you don't measure up to the sex money and power hierarchy you need to make your way to the front of this church today And you need to run into the arms of a God who loves you and he wants to belong with you forever. His love is greater. God's every thought towards you is love. We do three things every time we come to Redemption Church. We worship God together. We've done that. Number two, we receive the word of God together. We've done that. Number three, we come and we talk to God. For the next seven minutes, we're going to talk to God in this place. No pressure, but I would like to invite you, if you feel it in your heart, why don't you come to this altar today and ask for prayer? If you want prayer, why don't you come in the first two feet? That lets us know. But why don't you reach out to the love of God? Why don't you spend some time praying with your spouse, praying for your children, praying that the love of God would be totally everything that you need it to be why don't you pray over the physical areas of your life if you have felt like you don't belong why don't you come and find the place where you do belong right now in jesus name father i pray for everybody listening watching online everybody in the room right now lord that they would come in contact with the love of god the love of god changes everything lord i want them to realize that they belong to you that the reason you went to the cross is because you love them that the reason you will forgive them of all their sins is because you love them. Lord, I want them to realize that they belong to you. Lord, I pray for our marriages right now. Lord, I pray for our spouses. Lord, I pray I pray for our children and our homes. God, Father, let our homes, let our children, let, 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 our, let our families be filled with the love of God in the name of Jesus. We're going we're gonna to sing a song, right, in this place, and I, w- I want people to reach out to God in this place. I want you to reach out for something that is greater, because greater is here, because God is here. In In Jesus' name. Come on, let's pray. For more information about redemption, look us up online at redemption-church.com. We want to hear from you, so be sure to connect with us on Facebook, 
Twitter, or even our anonymous question text line at 214-856-0550. Thank you for joining us and have a blessed day.